Welcome to Festival Place, the pineapples in association with the Design Council. It is our final day today, and it's the day where this afternoon we're going to find out who won a coveted golden pineapple for Place. So um, a super exciting day today. Uh, this is a unique event where we bring together developers, designers, and placemakers from across the built environment to share their work as they vie to win a golden pineapple for Place. We want to celebrate the best in practice to shine a light on those delivering the change we want to see. My name is Christine Murray. I'm director of the Festival of Place and editor-in-chief of The Developer. We're a small independent media company focused on how to develop and support livable places where citizens thrive. This morning, we'll be hearing from the shortlist for the Pineapple for Activation, our last category to be presented. Uh, and this seeks to celebrate meanwhile projects, pop-ups, installations, or other happenings and initiatives that enhance the life of a place. Also today, we have our free lunchtime talk with Peter Barber, the architect on housing without corridors. And this afternoon, we'll announce all the winners of this week's Panda Pineapples, and I'll be handing out these gorgeous golden pineapple trophies. Oh, yes, trophy emoji. I forgot we had one of those. Awesome. So it's my pleasure to introduce your chair who's going to be hosting this morning's session. Laura Mark is an award-winning critic and editor, curator, and film director. She is keeper at Walmer's Yard, and she's former architecture projects manager at the Royal Academy of Arts. She was the architecture editor of the Architects Journal and editor of AJ Specification. Welcome, Laura. Hi, thanks, Christine. Um, I'm really looking forward to um, judging, uh, sorry, sharing the judging today uh, and seeing a bit more about all these projects. I think um, it's going to be a really interesting morning. Um, so let's get on with it. Um, we've got yeah, over to you, Laura. Oh, thanks. <laughs> we've got six projects shortlisted for activation today, um, and each team will have 10 minutes to present. So we're going to be hearing from you and I's Martin Evans. Uh, designer Wayne Hemingway, Jan Katane Architects, among many of the others responsible for today's shortlisted projects. Um, our judges will then have 10 minutes to ask questions and I'll be your chair. So it's my responsibility to keep everyone running to time. So I'll be giving everyone a, a warning when they've got about one minute to go. Um, so you will be meeting the judges after our first presenter when they'll be asking all their questions, but I'll just take a moment to introduce them now. So first up, we've got Will Sandy, who's the founding director of Will Sandy Design Studio, a landscape designer who believes that through careful engagement with multiple stakeholders, the gap can be bridged between clients, government and community. Um, Will Sandy was one of the founders responsible for the edible bus stops in London. Uh, then we also have um, Pamela Smith, who's a senior national consultant for garden and parks with National Trust, a horticulturalist with experience in public parks, botanics and historic gardens, who leads on presentation, garden history, interpretation and new design. And then we also have Hani Sally, uh, who's a co-founder of Migrants Bureau, whose interests sit at the intersection of architecture, policy, economics, international development and urbanism. Migrant Bureau is a multidisciplinary social design and urbanism practice, facilitating sustainable design interventions, research and community workshops for migrant communities. So thanks so much for all of our judges. Um, they've also been out looking at some of these projects today, so I've got quite a good insight on, on, on them all. Um, so feel free to use the kind of emoji button uh, whilst our presenters are talking about their projects. It's just down at the bottom of your screen. Um, and say hello to each other and share your comments and thoughts in the chat. Um, so now it's the time for our first project. So first up, we've got the Centre of Gravity Soapworks in Bristol, uh, presented by Olaide Obo from First Base. Uh, so this month-long exhibition in the Soapworks building uh, with the local art collective Centre of Gravity um, provided a showcase for 60 artists and was curated as a mix of inspiring contemporary art, film, talks and performance. So Alide, go for it. Oh, perfect. Sorry. Um, my screen decided not to um, 
um, not to hear me. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today. And um, I will make sure I stick to time. Um, so I hope you can see my screen OK. Actually, um, there we go. Perfect, brilliant. Um, so I'll kick off. Brit uh, thanks for the opportunity. Bristol has a very strong history of arts and culture. Um, Bristol was the first regional city outside of London to establish an artist-led collective. Um, and today, Bristol has the largest community of artists outside of London. And um, when you walk around the streets of Bristol, it, it, it's infectious. You feel it, it, you know, it's everywhere, whether it's street art, public art, etc. It is, it is so, you know, you can't get away from it. But 2020 was absolutely devastated for the Bristol arts and culture scene. Um, they faced a triple, triple threat. COVID-19 meant mass closures across the city. So lots of people, as a result, um, became unemployed who were working in the creative sector. Um, the recession meant um, lots of lots of people went, you know, completely, lots of venues and arts um, collectors did not have the funding to, to carry on. And then public sector funding also dried up. So it was a real challenging issue um, for Bristol, uh, which has such a strong focus on arts and culture within the, within the city. Um, and then Bristol also made it onto the global stage. I'm sure many of you saw, uh, heard and uh, debated this in, in many of your circles around um, the topping of the, of the um, Edward Colston um, um, statue in central Bristol. Um, and I think as a developer working in Bristol, we immediately reacted in terms of supporting um, local communities in and around um, Bristol. So whether it was supporting local schools, laptops for the for 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 the for the schools and for the community groups providing food boxes etc um so we did what most of most of us did in terms of just get, getting on and helping out but we also wanted to celebrate bristol and really support artists to regain their confidence a lot of artists lost their confidence in the immediate shutdown you know many have been working on on commissions or work for many many months um, only to have it completely halted um, and we wanted to help them to regain their confidence and to really celebrate Bristol and we have to be honest you know we're a developer what do we have um, we have a we, you know as I said we're working in Bristol we have a two and a half acre site in central Bristol um, and in, in that site, we have a grade two listed former soap factory, which is what you're looking at now. It dates back to the 1860s. Um, we had, we were, we, it was empty because we were working on our, our planning permission to, to get it ready to start rebuilding it. Um, um, so we, we decided to provide a space um, to enable artists to activate, to, to do some activation in, and really to help gain confidence, to get people back into um, supporting Bristol arts, arts and culture, and to, to, to start to think about what the future could hold. Um, we partnered up with Bath, Bath, Bath Spa University, a local arts collective called Centre of Gravity, and also funding, we got from, some funding from Arts Council, and we also provided some seed funding as well for that. Um, very small print, apologies, but we had over 60 artists get involved. Um, and in the selection of the artists, we're really, really clear to that Bristol ha is a very diverse population, as many of you will know. Um, as a result of, of the, um, the riots and the BLM protests over the summer, there's a real focus, a real, real push to make sure that everything that we do is inclusive, is, is very diverse. And I think the arts and culture scene had had lots of lots of challenges in terms of not being as representative as it could have been. So we spent a lot of time really engaging with artists, really going into local communities. You know, we have a big Somali and a big um, um, bl black um, Caribbean community in, in Bristol, and really going into those communities and understanding what does art and culture mean for you? How can we represent that visually, physically? What does that, what does that mean? And we'll be real broad about what art and culture means and not going down the typical route that we tend to, um, we tend to adopt in, in, in that. And um, we also wanted to really support young people. Um, Bristol has a very young population. Um, and unfortunately, young people felt that, again, their, their response in terms of their response to art and culture wasn't being given the, um, the, the stage and, and it wasn't at the forefront of how we rep represent arts and culture across the city. So we really wanted to get, get under the skin of that and really give young people that first opportunity to showcase, showcase their art, to, be, to, to gain a confidence actually to put their art out there and to work in a collective to really promote that. Um, so the, the key focus was, was really about, about young people, around marginalised communities, around real localised art as well. What does art mean in a, in a local community? We really wanted to question that and get people to rethink what that means. 
Um, and I'm just going to start sharing some slides with you of what that came out. You know, this is a this was one of the young young collectives who actually wanted to debate and talk about different things. And in the middle, they created a, a they created some, an, an installation, and they had a series of debates where they talked through that. Um, and they their topics range from Black Lives Matter through to sustainability and um, and um, and and how we improve um, how we become better better in terms of our planet. Real broad topics that you can see around the walls and some of the images. They debated that. They put post-it notes up. They talked about it, and that for them was art. And it was really interesting actually because their interpretation was very different to what lots of what many people thought. But that was what that's how that's what they came out of it with. Um, the other area that we really wanted to focus on was that was a real localized community art. Um, um, it was real localized, and actually, what we found was that the area had a lot of history and heritage, but not many people in the local area knew about it. And actually, turning that into art was something that the local community wanted to do. So really going back into heritage and, and we went into archive records looked for images stories and found um all these heritage photos of you know when the men went to war and the women were in the factories making the soap in this building um and really bringing that to life doing talks and heritage tours of, of around this taking young people schools um people in the low community on tours around their local area to show them the um what, what happened in their area getting people from the local community who had history to talk about and you know talking about their community going over the fence because obviously it's just covid times and sharing some of their stories from the past um but that real ingrained in, in the local in the local was important and asking people to share their stories and their images and their photos that they had from many, many years ago to start a conversation about what does that, you know, this is our this is our culture and let's bring it to the forefront. And out of that, we did we had an arts exhibition that showcased some of these images right across um, right in the building. There's some more of those. Um, and the other thing that we also wanted that also came out of the um, the consultation we got with artists was around um, event led art. You know, if arts people people were very focused on there were there was some visual art, but also how do I have particip participatory art? Um, so we created a series of activations where people can come in and do things and make things and create things and feel part of that art. And here you're seeing some someone doing some screen printing um again there were some performances we had you know visual um, dance performances within the space we had music there was, there was film um here is a a, 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 a african community group who were shaking who were doing some music and dance and getting people involved in that and telling stories um, the kind of the african storytelling through music and dance Again, there was some moving imagery, real mix of art, and actually really diversifying what art means to us. And I think for us, that you know, it, it really brought it to life, and it really made people engage, and really made people see art in a different way. We also had a really innovative way in terms of how we gathered um, responses and what people thought. So we encouraged people to just write their ideas, put it up on a post-it note, tell us where you're from. Um, the other thing that came up a lot within the art was around Brexit. Um, Brist Bristol voted um, to remain, and there was a real angst around that in the art that came came forward. People really wanted to celebrate being European. People wanted to celebrate culture, um, and as you can see from the flags, um, there was a lot about I want you know we wanted to talk about that diversity and inclusivity, and we thought that was really great to celebrate that. This was one of the young people's collectives as well, actually. Um, and I thought I'd just take you through some of the other um, some of the other interpretations of art that people came up with. This was a this was um, a really interesting um, take on a monopoly board that was challenging the idea of house prices going up and development actually um, being an issue in terms of creating um, increasing house prices in the local area. So this was a, an interactive, playful art. It was very childlike and it encouraged you to get involved and actually challenge your conceptions about what if, if development is good for for communities. Um, and I'll just scroll through. One minute left, really. So as a result of this, we had 60 artists get involved. Um, over 4,500 visitors came through in the midst of a pandemic. Really engaged local community, really, really inclusive and diverse. And I think for us, the fundamental thing that we've, we've got out of this will be got people to rethink what public art is. We now have an opportunity to rethink public art from, from a local authority perspective. Local authority, local authority is not just fixated now on statues and um, you know things in a public realm. They are open to inclusive art. They're open to um, cultural infrastructure as art. They're open to so many more things. And this was as a result of this activation that we did um, and during the pandemic. So that's it. Thank you very much for your time. I'll keep on flicking through until I stop.
Thank you. Um, it's a really fascinating project. It's such a, a difference in kind of media and different kind of um, ways of looking at, at art. Um, so I'd like to bring in the judges now um, to offer their take. Uh, perhaps, um, Hani, we could start with you. Do you have a question for Alide? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great product. Obviously, the timing of it worked out um, really well. And I, I have to commend you for kind of bringing something so so quickly together and, and bringing something so important. And obviously, acknowledging the diversity of Bristol's art scene and also the diversity of Bristol as a city. I mean, having lived there for a while and actually was there last week, um, you know, you really get a sense of the, this art scene that you're talking about. Um, I guess uh, this is probably a question that I think Pamela and Will probably will ask, uh, but it just sort of thinking about you've got, you had all this amazing momentum, this impact over this kind of one month period of jam packed exhibitions and um, workshops. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what the legacy of that looks like? What, what, what are the, some of the long term impacts that have kind of carried on or projects that have been set off? And is there any kind of active engagement in that from kind of the, your, your side of things or is it sort of like freewheeling on its own? Absolutely. We want, we definitely wanted, we didn't want it to be a one hit wonder and everyone forgot about it. What we did, what was important for us, we engaged with a, a really diverse group of people, which actually, you know, it, it was unheard of. Um, it's very, very, you know, arts and culture tends to happen in one part of Bristol and doesn't really go into like the dings and the old market, those real, you know, communities that are in the terminology I hate, hard to reach, but you know, it, it, it doesn't happen there. So for us, we really engaged that community, which was great. We are now working on a number of initiatives, localizing those communities to, 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 to continue that art, um, 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 uh, you know, to continue the art journey and to give that confidence actually, because I think lots of young people and lots of community groups were confident that I showcased my art for a month and 5,000 people came along. What else can I do? So we're, we're putting those initiatives in place to support those communities and linking them up with local groups to do that. But importantly for us, what we also did was we, we help people to think about art in a different way because we definitely see our, our, our space as being arts and culture driven, you know. So now we can go into the we can go into the council and have a different conversation about public art. Honestly, the council initially was saying public art, a statue, a mural, usual stuff. And now they're saying, oh, actually, maybe you could have um, you could have a continuously changing arts uh, um, arts intervention. Maybe you could have cultural infrastructure as art, which is actually what the artists said they want. They want space. They want affordable space. They don't want another statue. They want affordable space that they can work in, in perpetuity, that will be available for communities to do arts and culture in. And actually, that conversation has shifted in the council. And for me, that is the biggest success of the project, that we can actually enable space that will be for artists, led by artists, curated by artists for the long term, and importantly, it's affordable. That's great, thanks. Thank um, Will, do you want to come in there with a question? Yeah, I think, you know, Hani's probably right, and um, we've probably all got a bit of synergy where we're going with the questions. Um, mm -hmm. I, I sort of grew up in Bristol and Bath, so I know that it's a really strong, dynamic community, and reassuring them and building the trust is quite critical to, to win over, and as first base is sort of fairly new in the area, yeah. it'd be really interesting to understand how you were able to communicate to them that you weren't using them, for want of a better word, to kind of drive the cool into the project and how you reassured them that they'll be part of a new chapter in this history of Bristol's kind of landscape. And you've got, you've got co-working and other studio spaces as part of the longer term development. Will you be able to host or have residencies long term championing the art through the development? Thank you for that question. Really, really good question. And I think this is something that when we started on this journey, all the artists said, we're tired of it. You know, this is what happened. A lovely developer comes along, you basically use us to get your values up and get everyone excited. And then actually you just tell us, bye bye, we've had enough of that. And our develop the development benefits from all this great publicity. And then we have nowhere to go. And it's a model that's hap happened and happening in Bristol over and over and over again. And to be honest, it's happening, it's happening in London and happening in London over and over and over again. So we wanted to start a conversation. When we started that conversation with the Arts Collective, we're really upfront. But that's not our approach. Our approach is not to do something fun and then disappear. We want to, to ingrain um, arts and culture into the design and the DNA of this place for the long term. So we started, that was our starting point. And I and I'll completely agree with you. There was a lot of there was a lot of distrust. It was like, yeah, yeah, we've heard it all before. You're just gonna do exactly the same thing. So our approach was to um, provide a space, 
and allow the arts collective to completely curate it. We didn't get involved. And there were some things that we were not comfortable with. I showed you that Monopoly board that was intentionally saying development is not good. And we had to take that on the chin and say, look, you know, it's art, you know, it's subjective, do, you know, do what you want. But I think this, the second thing is we asked um, the arts collective to actually write the arts and culture strategy for the development long term. So we got them involved very early on and we said, actually use, the, the, use this activation as a bit of a test opportunity to ask those questions. And when they asked those questions, what the cultural community came back with was, we don't want more statues, we want space. Affordable workspace is what, is what our industry needs, especially after a challenging year like this. So that's what we need. And actually we said, okay, if that's what you need, how can we, how can we allow, enable that long-term? Which is why we went back to the council with the arts, you know, with um, Centre of Gravity saying, we've done, we've done consultation, we've spoken to the arts community, we can provide, we can happily do all the public art, the lovely, we've done it before, we've done murals, we've done all the things that people love and will enjoy, and um, art in the public realm, all of that stuff, but actually, cultural infrastructure is what Bristol needs, because they've had this legacy of, meanwhile, disappear, meanwhile, disappear, they want something long-term that the arts community can curate, it's affordable, long-term, and actually, they don't have to constantly worry about, I've got to move on, because it's going to be redeveloped. And we had to have that conversation with the council. The council took them a while to get on board with it and they're supportive of it now. So I, I think gaining that trust from the beginning, from the arts, from the collectives that we are, we, we're here for the long term. We're not gonna disappear. We're not gonna, dis we're not just using you for this. And then showing them, proving it by going jointly to the council and asking for a want that was very clear from the community has, has helped us gain that trust. And I'll be honest with you, we speak very different languages. <laughs> you know, we are, we focus on buildings, technical, boring stuff. The arts, arts communities focus on all the things that we don't know anything about, but actually that coming together, you know, with a, with a clear focus of, we want to work together. We want to do this for the long term was our starting point and that's kept us along on the journey. So, and also we're working on other things that we've got a couple of other schemes in Bristol. We've, we've, we've gone back to the community engaging and, and it's a completely different approach in a, in a different part of Bristol. We're in Westbury Park, different part of Bristol, but again, it's with that focus on long term and how can we work together to create a place that's, you know, has arts and culture ingrained into it. Cool. I hope that answered your question. It was a bit yeah, long. Yeah, yeah. I look forward to seeing it. Thank you. I'm going to bring in Pam now. Pam. Hi. Thanks for that. I really, I'm sorry I couldn't see it, but it really set the scene. I think I'm really interested in your comments about how what you did influenced new ways of thinking about public art in Bristol, and also about engaging with some quite young artists. And I wondered. Was this the first time some of those artists did work with sort of community engagement and with heritage? Yes, absolutely. Um, it, it was really interesting. Bristol is a very young population, very young population. Mm. Um, and when we initially went out to engage with communities, we did a lot of engagement. Where our scheme is, um, you know, as, as in most cities, you've got the rural areas, and if you know Bristol, it's in the Dings, in an old market quite deprived, low socioeconomic um, t um, status, and actually not much green space. It's very, it's landlocked, you know, lots and lots of, very built up, you know. So lots of issues around air quality, lots of issues around childhood obesity, lots and lots of issues, let's just let's say that. And actually um, young people in that area didn't really, didn't really feel confident or have a, or have a voice. So we went to existing um, community, young groups, and went to speak to them about, about you know, creating art. Um, one, they, what the young people's collectives were large in music focus. They did lots of music, you know, music, uh, music um, te technology, coding, etc. Um, and it was it, for them. It was a real um, shift. They they lacked a lot of confidence within their own circles. They were very confident, but having to put this on put this on a scale and showing four and a half thousand people, and not only that, having to speak to people about it was a big, um, you know, it was a massive shift for them. So we did a lot of work in terms of getting some of the older artists to mentor them, you know, explaining, you know, if you if if you if you create art, the, the second part of it is really helping to helping to articulate it to other people, getting them buying, getting people to understand it. Not everyone's going to like it. You're not trying to win everyone's approval, but what you're trying to do is help them understand what your what your what your thinking is, what your rationale for it is, and how you came about it. Um, 
some of the things that helped to do that was get them to focus on things that were really local to them. So when we did the heritage project is, you know, go and speak to 10 people in your area and find out what, if they have any pictures or stories or memories from, you know, many, many years ago and things that they did in this local area. So that was quite normal. That felt quite normal to them. And then they could take it to the next level. Another really interesting thing we got them to do was to write letters, literally pick a, it was, it was a pick, a, pick an address in the, in the phone book in a completely different country and write a letter and see if they'll write back. And it was, it was amazing. People wrote to Australia, people wrote to India, people just found an address. And amazingly, people wrote back. So it was little things like that. I just thought, gosh, I, and it was this, that, that was really focused on this idea about Bristol being a global city. They didn't, Bristol didn't, you know, because of Brexit, there was a lot of discussions about, we don't want Bristol to feel like it's cut off from the world. So we're going to reach out to the world and write letters to everyone. And us. And it was just really interesting ideas that I really got them to engage. And they were really, because they had written the letters, they got letters, but they were confidently articulating. I wrote to, you know, John in India, he lives with it, you know, they were able to express that really well. So I think it gave them the confidence and it definitely gave them that first step into this is, you know, I can be, I can do a different type of art. It's not just about going into an art gallery in in the middle of you know um, Clifton and seeing beautiful beautiful paintings, it can be participatory. It can be I can't say that word. It can be participatory. It can be different. It can be inclusive. It can be it can be event led. It can be anything. It's all art. So it gave them that confidence, definitely. Great, right, thanks. thanks. Thanks, Elide. Um, that's all we've got time for in this uh, set of questions, but um, I think you gave a really passionate presentation, and um, it's really great to see a kind of different approach to looking at different ways of doing art, I think. Brilliant. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thanks all. Much appreciated. Thanks. Um, so we're going to move swiftly on to our, our next project. So um, next up, we're going to hear about the Bird Box in Bromsgrove. Uh, it's going to be presented by Ruth Sears of One Creative Environments. Um, so the Bird Box transformed an unattractive site to throw a lifeline to local businesses in providing socially distant space for small retail outlets and outdoor eateries to serve customers during the pandemic restrictions. So take it away, Ruth. Thank you. Okay, can everyone see the screen? Yeah, that's great. That's brilliant. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not, not quite on the first slide. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to present the Bird Box. Um, myself and everyone involved in this project are really excited that we've been shortlisted for the application award. Um, so the Bird Box is a public realm space and community area in the town centre of Bromsgrove. It's right in a prominent location adjacent to the High Street. Um, it hasn't always been a public realm space. In fact, um, before we developed the site, it was derelict for five years and it was hoarded off. It was a, a really energetic. and they lost their retainer money from that process and that money is in fact what has been used to reinvest in the site and give it back to the community. This, um, this process wasn't that straightforward. Initially people were wanting Sorry to, to interrupt to Ruth, but we just lost stuff. your presentation. We're not seeing it and your sound keeps cutting out a bit. Do you want to um, just re refresh the page and try again? Um, okay, sorry. And if you switch to... Um, on the bottom right hand side of, of your screen, you should see a little button by the, um, which says HD. If you switch it to LD, it might make okay. it. Okay, one second. Yeah. Okay. Um, So we had, stakeholders had to put on a, a fair bit of pressure and 
through our design work, we demonstrated that we could actually deliver a great scheme within this really tight budget that we had. So initially, public consultation and stakeholder engagement was really key. We wanted to understand how the community wanted to use the space, what events they wanted to do on the space, and really get them excited about the prospects of what, what we could do there. So we met stakeholders on site and we undertook a public consultation process. And that helped us form a really strong brief for the project that's been delivered now. So now the site's open, it's been really well used, it's really popular, it's welcoming, it's accessible for everyone. It's a place that the community can come and meet and hang out. It supports local traders and businesses. It's a really fun, active and vibrant space and it's been a real lifeline for some of the local businesses during the COVID pandemic. So the site has a stage for performances and events and that's in a great great location. It's on the site line as you're approaching the site from the high street. We've got really big seating areas that are fun and nice places for people to meet and socialise. Um, there's a big open area to the north of the site that's been designed so it could hold a stage or marquee. Um, it could have a, a temporary ice rink in the winter. And across the site, there are plots for mobile businesses and traders to locate and they can set up shop for the day. Um, the site perimeter is really permeable. We wanted people to see them. We wanted to encourage people into the site. Um, and the planters around the perimeter of the site also act as vehicle barriers. So um, the site is, is safe. The great thing about this project was the design team and the sorry the whole project team that worked on it. Um, we're all local, so we all had that sort of um, excitement about delivering something for our community. North Worcestershire Economic Development and Regeneration worked in partnership with Bromsgrove District Council, and they employed ourselves when creative as designers and HCT as QS, um, and we're both Midlands based. And then when the project got to site, um, Kelbeck Civils and Whiting's Landscape were the contractors, and they're both local as well. Um, across the businesses, I remember the visiting site when the project was being um, was being built and the, the workers on site were really excited about bringing their families to the site when it opened and showing their families what kind of... Really sorry um, to interrupt again, we've just lost your um, presentation again and your sound briefly. Okay, I apologise. Can I just reshare? Yeah, if you just do that. Oh. Sorry, I'm having. Okay. Um, so budget was a bit of a constraint on this project, um, therefore we had to think really creatively. So initially reclaiming and recycling materials where we could was really key. We've used um, block paving and timbers uh, to face gabion baskets. We retained some of the existing hoarding as a backdrop to the, to the site. Existing building foundations had to stay in place, so we worked um, site levels around those. We've used um, budget materials such as artificial turf and, and the end of the line paving product. And planters that are usually used in the nursery trade have enabled us to bring trees into the site. To add a bit of excitement and interest and a bit of um, a unique identity for the site, we designed um, graphics that have been applied to both the paving and the fencing. Uh, we really wanted to provide lots of seating and places for people 
we couldn't afford off the shelf kind of street furniture so we had to design um, bespoke furniture we we um, introduced these really big kind of blocky seating units they're covered in a really thick artificial turf people love using them they've been really successful um, and they're really well used um, also the plant is around the perimeter of the site are made from gabion baskets so across this site we've really had to use bespoke design to deliver far more than we could have done otherwise um, so it's been it's been a real success to deliver more than we could have done and um, it's also given the site a really interesting feel and quality from the outset stakeholders were really um, set on making sure that this site could also support uh, small local businesses and startup businesses so across the site we've built in locations and plots for um, traders to come along and set up there's hookup points where they can attach to electricity and they've got water supply so it offers a place for businesses and entrepreneurs to uh, to trade from. Uh, this is run and managed by Bromsgrove Indie Club, who represent independent traders in Bromsgrove. Events, events at the site are also, they just add another dimension and make the site really interesting and a focus for the community. As you can see from the photograph here, there's uh, lots of people attending. There's a local band on stage, so people have turned out to support the band and watch the performance. Um, and you can see the site is uh, a real community hub. Overall, the, the project's been a really great success. The client is really, really happy with the outcome of, of the project, uh, so much so that they're looking now at how they can um, increase, and increase the site and develop the, the last area of the site that um, we weren't able to develop previously because of the budget constraints that we Um, but it would be great if it became a permanent asset for Bromsgrove. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. We kind of we lost you a little bit there, but I think we got kind of a good idea of the project. Um, so I'm going to bring Pam. Um, she she visited it uh, out of all the judges. So Pam, would you like to ask a first question? Hi Ruth, Hi, thanks for that. No, we did get most of it and it was great seeing all the images, um, much more than I'd, I'd seen before actually. I was really interested in what you said because I think it's definitely an example of where limited budget really prompted some really good design solutions and I took a lot of photos, I was really inspired by the Gabians and actually I can attest that seating is really comfortable. <laughs> um, I just wondered about what's your longer term aims for this because obviously it's created quite a buzz in that area and I've read about it in local papers um, and also who maintains it because I was really impressed with the cleanliness of the site and the, the standard of maintenance so who's who looks after it and what are your longer term plans for this now? with a life expectancy for two years I think everyone sort of in the background is hoping that it will become a bit more permanent the the land itself is owned by Bromsgrove District Council um, and they they did want to develop it Or originally it was a, a market hall site um, and yeah and they, they they were looking to sell it on and develop it and to make some money. But because of the success of the project, I think they're hoping that it may become a bit more of a permanent asset. Um, uh, so the, the site is managed by Bromsgrove District Council. So when there's big events, they bring, you know, they bring out the bins and, and things like that, and they, they clean, make sure the site is clean. Um, and they also have an events manager that um, has organised events that are going on on the site this year, and that will just carry on for the life expectancy of the project.
And we're struggling with signal from you a little, Ruth. I don't know if you can, Ruth. Um, we're struggling with signal a little from you. I don't know if you could, if you can hear me. Um, but if you could maybe refresh um, your screen, and that might help. Okay. We'll just give her a second to come back in. Yeah, I think we've got, the, I've got most of the answer, so that's fine. Thanks, you're back. Um, if you could just make sure that any other applications are um, closed on your computer as well, that normally helps too. Yeah, sure. But, um, maybe we'll move to a question from Hani. Uh, yeah. Um... Thanks, uh, thanks Ruth for presenting that. It was really, it's really good to see it, the, the space being used and to see all the events and stuff like that. The pictures were really actually gave a good sense of the space. Um, I, I have a question which I think you may have answered in your presentation, but it may have cut out. Um, I know that you said that the site is gonna, there's a second phase that's kind of being considered now. Uh, have you thought about what you know what what is it that you're planning on doing with that second phase in terms of what do you think is missing and and, and what do you think you're going to try to provide to to make up for that? Well, I guess we haven't got as far as thinking what the second space is going to be. It's, um, it's uh, the, the council were talking about it and trying to find a um, budget to use it. Oh, excellent. I think we'd have to go back to the community to find out if there was anything that they felt was missing or that we hadn't been able to provide in, in the first landscape um, and use that process to help, again, to develop the site more. Thanks, Rue. Um, I think we're, you're freezing a bit, but I think we're getting a, a kind of a little a gist of the answer okay, so um, that's okay i'm going to move to to will um for a final question thanks hi Ruth. um yeah i just wanted to get a bit of a, a steer on how the council see the site long term and obviously it's development so it's worth money and it's quite a dynamic thing to turn it into a park and if it's going to be a park ongoing will they then have a, a political or social wrangle to reclaim it as a as a viable development site and we've seen it with the Dalston Curve Garden here in London where it became quite a valuable community asset and has really kind of captured the hearts and minds of the community I don't know if she's gone um and and so it'd just be interesting to see how the site coming forward might have a bit more public realm as a result of this or will it be full site development there's a waitrose on the other bit um so it's just sort of managing expectations and seeing how this will this will go forward and what impact it will have yes i guess it's up to um bronzegrove district council how how long they retain the site and when the site does become viable because it, it, it isn't currently viable in the economic climate for development um but i think seeing the space what, what we've done with the space and seeing how well it's used and also it is really right in the heart of the town it's a great place for people to meet up and th there is no other space like it in Bromsgrove um, and with all those things there may be a lot of pressure from the community and other people that are involved on the site um, like the local traders people that want to come and uh, do performances or hire the space and use the space for activities um, I think the pressure on on that will in, will sort of hedge the council off a while and hopefully the site I think it has a longer life expectancy than its original design intent. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, that was uh, really helpful, I think, to explain it. But um, we're going to take a break now uh, for the next uh, 15 minutes. We'll be back on the hour at 11. Um, so if, uh, if you want to join um, one of the tables in the social lounge, uh, you'll be able to kind of meet some of the other people uh, here today. Um, but we'll be back with more kind of awards presentations at um, 
11 o'clock. Thank you.